All right, so now we move on to the first lesson of our third unit, and that is system of equations. Now, system of equations expands a little bit from Math 10C, because in Math 10C, our focus was on linear functions and how many uh, possible solutions. So we could have one, we could have infinite, we could have zero solutions. Now what we're going to do is, because we've done these two previous units on quadratic functions and quadratic equations, we have a really good understanding of what quadratic equations and functions do in terms of what is a quadratic function, what does it look like graphically, we found that it looks like a parabola. So let's expand that definition and break into this unit by solving systems of equations graphically that may be a linear quadratic system or quadratic quadratic system. Now, first and foremost, a system of equations consists of two or more equations that are considered to be together. So just by definition, you have one equation, you have another. When you put them together, they'll have two different graphs that will have some sort of solution, which is a common point between them, which we'll cover in just a second. So we look down here, the solutions to a system of equations is some ordered pair in some x, y, where we have some input, output, x, y, where the graphs intersect and must satisfy each equation. And that's really important because when we get a solution or an ordered pair in this x and y, we're going to want to go back to our original equations, sub it in, and verify, which is that key buzzword, that it works for both equations. If it can satisfy both equations, then we say these are determined to be common points on the graph. And so I would just make sure you highlight this first paragraph in the following way, because we want to be very careful of in this unit, what are we actually looking for? It's these points of intersection or these common points. Now, first and foremost, a linear quadratic system. That means we have a linear equation and a quadratic equation. And when they come together, they give a certain amount of solutions. Now, let's take a look at these different situations. First and foremost, if we have a linear quadratic system with two solutions, one example, and this is just one example, like we could come up with a bunch of different other ones, but one example might be the following. Suppose that this is my quadratic function where I have some sort of upwards facing parabola, and then what I'm going to do over this is I'm going to superimpose some sort of linear function right on this. So there we go, arrows on the end indicating that this goes to infinity. You would say that the two solutions are here and here or the two intersection points are on the left and the right where the red graph crosses the blue graph. Now, again, this is just one way of representing this. The, the graphs could be like different slopes. They could be uh, reflected over the x-axis. There's a bunch of different ways we're going to see this, but this is just one way of showing the two solutions in a linear quadratic system. What if we had no solutions? Well, no solutions is going to look very similar. In, in fact, the two functions we're going to draw over this are the red one as such, and then if I want to draw a linear system that is superimposed on this graph, but it never crosses this, what we're going to do is we're going to put it as such like this, where you clearly see there's no crossover. In fact, there's some gap between these two. And if you, there's a gap between the two graphs, they'll never extend to, or they'll never cross over as they extend to left and right to infinity. So we see this as no solution because there's no intersection. Now, when we look at one solution, this can be represented in a couple different ways. First and foremost, we're going to do a graph that looks like the following. I'll draw my red graph over, and I want to make sure I stay consistent to this, so I'm going to make sure my quadratic is in red. So let's say I have this quadratic here, and I want to make sure that this has one solution. Well, in just a second, we're going to define what a tangent line is, but I'm going to use that word. We are going to draw a tangent line to this curve such that it only crosses exactly one time. So there's this point in which the linear function crosses over the quadratic function, but it's right at a point of tangency, which results in one solution. Now, this could also be written as we could have some sort of line, just like we've drawn in the previous examples with the quadratic in red as we've done, but we could also do this where maybe the quadratic looks like this, or you know, maybe even we draw the quadratic looking downwards like this, either way, totally fine. And I don't want to confuse these, so maybe I'll just draw it a little bit off in the margin here. There we go. So we could have an upwards graph, a downwards facing graph, either one. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show one solution looking like this. We can have a point of tangency where the slope is zero and it's a direct horizontal line. That's one example. And I'm going to make sure I put my black dot there representing that this is one solution. I could also get a vertical line. And a vertical line would look like this through the graph. If I have a vertical line, we know this is an undefined function because there is it doesn't pass the uh, line test or the vertical line test. So it's not a function, but it is definitely a graph that could result in solutions. We would look at this and say there is one solution here. 
So even with horizontal lines and vertical lines, we can see we get one solution. In fact, when you go into calculus, the horizontal line is essentially taking the derivative of the function, and that's going to give you the rate of change at that very bottom piece, which rate of change at the bottom piece or at that maximum or minimum is zero. So this is that invariant point or not that invariant point, but this inflection point in which we see the positive slope become negative or vice versa, negative slope become positive. So this is just a couple ways in which we could represent two solutions, no solution, one solution in all the different forms. Now, these could obviously be upwards, downwards, different slopes all over the place. The graphs might look different, but these are generally what you're going to find if you have two solutions, no solution, or one solution. Now, again, we wanted to define a couple things here. So tangency to the curve or some line that is tangent to the curve it, when it's tangent to the curve, it means it touches exactly one time along that curve. Now, a point of tangency is that specific point in which we see that tangency happen. So tangent to the curve just means it touches one point. The point of tangency is that specific x, y in which it touches that, that specific ordered pair. All right. Now, instead of looking at linear quadratic, what if we did quadratic and quadratic? What would happen if I took two parabolas and I only wanted one solution? Well, to get that, we could do this in a couple different ways. First and foremost, I'm going to draw them in red and blue. So maybe I do one here as such. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to overlay this with a blue graph that faces the other way, but it's only going to cross exactly one time. Let me back that up. I'm going to draw it like such. Ah, let's see. It might not let me uh, use my tool with this. So I'm going to just freehand it. There we go. So we see one graph face up, one graph face down. In this case, it only crosses exactly one time. There would be an example of one solution for here. And you know what? Because this is our main case, I'm just going to actually draw it right over top of this uh, graph. I'm not going to try and split it up here. So we're going to draw it here. I'll put my arrows on the end. There we go. And then again, I probably have to freehand this one. So I'm going to go as we touch exactly one time and then we come back down and let's make this as neat as possible. There we go. Okay. And then I'll make sure I put my black dot saying that they cross exactly one time here. Now, what if they have two solutions? Well, very, very similar. What we can do is we can have it overlaid in the sense of, let's say, for example, I have my red graph, which faces up just like in the previous examples. I put my arrows on the end representing it extends to infinity. Let's say I have my downward graph. Well, to get two, uh, or two solutions, they have to cross twice, meaning they have to overlay each other and not just cross at their minimums and maximums. So we look at the graph and it would look like the following. Once we see this, we're like, okay, not bad. And these could be off-centered by a little bit. These ones are kind of perfectly lined up. So that doesn't always happen. Sometimes they're a little more left. Sometimes they're a little more right. But we get one solution here. We get another solution here. There's examples of a quadratic quadratic that gives you two solutions. Now, no solutions just means that they face away from each other. One faces up, one faces down, and they never touch, meaning they're at different y values. So I'm going to draw over the red graph, just as we've done in the positive axis here. What I'm going to then do is draw the blue graph down below like this. And as we can see, there's that void white space between the two. If you can see white space or there's some empty piece of the Cartesian real plane in there, then you know that these don't cross. There's no solutions. There's no intercepts, as we call it. So therefore, we would say no solution. Lastly, the interesting thing is with linear and linear, you can get infinite solutions. We know it just meant it was the same line. This is no different. If I'm talking about quadratic quadratic, to get infinite solutions, what I can do is I can draw my red graph. Maybe it looks like this. And then what I'm going to do is to get infinite solutions, I'm going to just overlay another graph right on top of this that is the exact same quadratic function. And not to confuse them, I'm just going to make sure that they are as close as possible, but you can still see each color. So these directly overlay each other, meaning they have they intersect at every single point in the real plane that they exist. So this would be an example of infinite solutions. Now, again, infinite solutions can also exist in linear lines, linear, linear functions. You look at those, and if they are representative of the exact same line, you also say those are infinite. All right. Now, steps in solving the linear quadratic or quadratic systems graphically. The most important thing is we need to isolate both equations for y. If we don't isolate both equations for y, when we go to enter it in our graphing calculator, we actually won't even be able to because our graphing calculators read functions as y is equal to some sort of variable in terms of x as an input. 
Now, we want to enter both of those equations into our graphing calculator once we've isolated them both for y. Adjust the window settings such that we can see the two graphs that are in the window. So example is like the ones above. You can clearly see both of these functions and where they intersect or where they don't intersect. Then what we want to do is we want to, once we've adjusted our windows, we want to graph and find the solutions. They give you the TI uh, instructions, so second trace, intersect, enter three times. On the Casio, the only difference is you go shift G solve and then ISCT. That's the only difference. So it's the same kind of keys. You're talking about a second and then a trace, or in this case, G solve, and then your intersect key, just rather than saying intersect, it's just the short form of it. Once you do that, you may have to do it once, twice, or not at all, and then you want to state the ordered pair that makes up the x and y where they meet based on the calculator. Lastly, you want to verify those solutions and that it works for both equations. That's really, really important. Verify, take it, the numbers, plug them into the calculator, or not to the calculator, but to the functions and, and solve. But you need to make sure it's both because if it doesn't satisfy both, then it doesn't work for those. So we got to be very careful with that. Okay, now let's flip the page here. We're going to look at an example where we type these into our graphing calculator. Again, first error or first issue with these is that they're not isolated for Y. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to isolate both these for Y, and then we'll talk about how we put them into our graphing calculator. First and foremost, I look at that first function and I'm like, well, Y is negative here. Let's add it across. If I add it across, this is going to become for the first equation, Y is equal to X minus one. There's our first one. And it's X instead of X minus one, it's actually X plus one. There we go. So this is going to be our first function. The second function, we see that y is positive here. I'm going to take all of these terms and move them across to the other side. So this is going to give me y is equal to negative x squared. Then we had the positive 6x, which we're going to add across. And then lastly, we subtract 3 from this side or from the left over to the right. And here is our two different y's. Now we're going to plug these in in terms of our y1 and y2. So I'm going to rewrite them over here. First of all, we had x plus 1 for y1. That was the first function. The second function was negative x squared plus 6x, and then lastly, minus 3. There we go. Okay, we need certain window settings here. The window settings, we're just going to keep them standard. So for our x minimum, we're going to put negative 10. For our max, we're going to put 10. For our scale, we're going to keep it as 1. Remember, we want to keep that scale as uh, one as much as possible. If we need to adjust it for really large numbers, we can, but I mean, it's probably ideal to keep it as is. Now, if this is the standard window or the negative 10 to 10 and negative 10 to 10, we're just going to draw our basic Cartesian planes such that the cross appears right in the middle. Now, what we can do is we can sketch in a very, very rough sketch of what our functions look like. So first of all, the quadratic, it looks like the following, kind of cuts up like this, comes back down. We want to put arrows on both sides because we know that this extends downwards to infinity from its maximum. Now, the other piece we want to draw is our linear function. Our linear function, we see it as y is equal to x plus 1. It's a positive slope, and it looks like the following. It kind of starts over here on the left, it cuts over top, it crosses through twice, and there it is. Now, I just want to make sure that this is a touch better, so crosses through about there. That would be a little bit better. Now we're going to put arrows on the end, so arrow representing that it goes left to infinity, right to infinity, and now our two solutions are going to be on our left and on our right. Okay, now in your calculator, you're going to go second trace and then intersect once you've typed in y1 and y2. In your uh, Casio calculator, shift, g solve, and then your intersect key. Now when you do that, here's the two intersections. On the left-hand side, you're going to get 1 and positive 2. For this x-intercept, or not x-intercept because we're not in quadratic equations, this is the intersection point, and then our second intersection point is going to be at 4 and 5. So we'll maybe, I think I'll be able to write that in here, yeah, perfect. 4 and 5, and that is representative of this intersection point here. Awesome, so let's write these off to the side. So if we have 1 and 2 and 4 and 5, let's write them here. So as an ordered pair, 1 and 2, close the bracket, 4 and 5. Now, when they say verify algebraically, all we're going to do is just take these points of 1 and 2 and 4 and 5 and plug them into these two equations here. Now, I highly recommend you put them into the original equations. That's going to be the best thing because if you alter equations and you do it wrong, sometimes this can lead to a mess. So take them and plug them into this original here. Now, to do this, let's start off with dealing with 1 and 2 into both of these equations. 
So I'm going to take both of these and be like, well, if I need to solve in one and two, I'm going to start by going for the first equation. We had x first, so it's going to be one minus the y value, y value being two. And then we had plus one is equal to zero. Well, this is the same as one plus one minus two. That's zero equals zero. So this works perfect we would say the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. As soon as we verify it like that, we're good. Now, that's only one of the equations. So what we're going to do, draw a vertical line. We're going to move to our next equation. It is x squared, x being 1. So 1 squared, our y, or we had a negative 6x, which is negative, time, negative 6 times 1. We have a plus y, our y being the 2. And then we have a positive 3 on the other term here. Okay, perfect. Now, 1 squared is 1, 1 minus 6 is negative 5, negative 5 plus 5, this is 0 is equal to 0, our left-hand side is equal to our right-hand side. Hey, look, it works for the first equation. Great. Now, we have a little bit of work to do. We need to take that secondary point of 4 and 5 and do the exact same process again. So for the first equation, it's going to be 4 minus the other value, which was 5, and then we want to go, if it was x minus y, then we added 1, which was equal to 0. 4 minus 5 is negative 1. 1 plus negative 1 is 0. So 0 equals 0. Left-hand side equals right-hand side. Excellent. There we go. All right. We got one more to work with. It was our second equation. So we went with x squared, x squared being 4. So 4 squared uh, minus 6 times 4, which is the x value. We had a y, so plus our 5, and then we have a plus 3, and this was all equal to 0. Excuse the squishiness of this. Now, 16 minus 24, 16 minus 24 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 5 plus 3, well, that's negative 8 plus 8. This gives us 0 is equal to 0, aka the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. And hey, look at that we get it confirmed, or we verified it for all of the equations. So this is that big piece I wanted you to see here. Now, what I'm going to do is just to make this a touch neater, and so that I can fit the zero on the other side, I'm just going to shuffle this a little bit left. Now what I can do is zoom back in, and then just make this equal to zero on the right-hand side there. Perfect. All right, so whenever they say verify algebraically, they're just saying take those points, plug them back into the original equations, the unaltered equations being the ones they give you, and see if the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Okay, let's try this one more time, just with slightly different functions. So they give us, in part b, some new equations here. Both of these are quadratic. Now, what we want to do is solve them both for y. We realize that there's a y here isolated, and that we can move this y over and add the negative 19 over this way. So let's do that. For the first one, we're going to take these two terms and move them across because the y is positive on the left. This will give us y is equal to negative 2x squared minus 16x minus 26. The second equation, if I move the y from being negative to positive and I take the negative 19 and move it to the left, this is going to be y is equal to x squared plus 8x and then plus 19 because we've exchanged the y and the 19 from each side. Now, let's just take a second to rewrite these out over off on our uh, right-hand side here. So for y1 in your calculator, you're going to go into your graphing mode and type in negative 2x squared minus 16x and then minus 26. Once you have that typed in, you're going to type in our other function, which is x squared uh, plus 8x and then plus 19. Now, for our window settings, we want to just change these just slightly. Um, what we're going to realize is that our functions are primarily on the second, uh, second quadrant, I should say. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this negative 10 for x. That will be fine. Its minimum or its maximum, sorry, is going to be 2. So we're just going to show a little bit of the x-axis in the positive direction. We're going to keep our scale as 1 like normal, keep our y scale as 1. And then for our uh, y minimum, we're going to make this negative 5. We don't need to see as much of the negative y's, but we still want to see 10 in terms of our positive y's. All right, now this is going to give us a graph that looks like the following. We're going to draw our axis such that it is mainly showing the second quadrant. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the different functions here. y2, the y2 function, it's going to look like the following. I'm going to get something that is upwards facing and kind of looks something like this here. 
Now, you're going to draw arrows on the end because you know this extends to infinity. I'm going to draw the blue graph, which is our uh, skinnier graph, and the one that faces down, it's the y1. I'm going to draw this in the following way. Starts down here, cuts up, cuts right back down. There we go. And I should see if I can use the tool for this just to make it a touch neater. If I can, this would be great. Nah, it's not going to let me. So we're just going to do this by hand. There we go. So it comes up, cuts back down, arrows on the end, representing that this goes to infinity. And you know what I'm going to do with this? I'm going to put blue next to y1, and then I'm going to put red next to y2, just so you know which graph goes with which. And we should actually do that not to move on from this problem. I actually want to just backpedal this a little bit and then label it for both of these two as well. Our blue graph was y1. It was the linear function. Our red graph was the quadratic. There we go, just so that we, we have some color coordination. And in your uh, calculator, some of you have the color calculators, so you'll have the same function. Some of you don't have the color calculator, so it sometimes helps just to have a little bit of color in here. Okay, we go back down. Our two solutions are going to be located here at the first intersection and at the second intersection. Now, if you do your second trace intersect or your shift G solve intersect, what you're going to find is that one of these points is at negative 5 and 4. So that's our point here. Perfect. And I'll just put a little arrow to it. Our other point is going to be at negative 2 or negative 3 and 4. So we want to make sure that we have that here. So negative 3. Uh, and then I don't want to have it overlapping on the graph there. So maybe we'll do that. Um, what's going to be your best spot? Probably like right here. Negative 3 and positive 4. There we go. I just don't like when it overlaps on a line just so you can't see it. Okay, let's write these solutions out all over off on the left hand side. So first solution, negative 5 for x, 4 for y. Our second solution was negative 3 for x, 4 for y. There we go. Now, to verify this algebraically, again, we don't want to go into our altered equations. What we want to do is start plugging these numbers into these equations here. That's going to be our best way of going about this. Okay, when we look at this, we're going to start off with our first equation, which was the 2x squared. So I'm going to try and write it as far left as I can. It's going to be 2 times negative 5 squared. Uh, we go plus 16 times that same x value, which is negative 5. We then go uh, plus 4, which is equal to negative 26. Okay. Now, from here, this is the same as saying 2 times 25 plus 16 times negative 5 which actually is equal to negative 80. So we can just convert that plus four is equal to negative 26. And then from here, we're going to get 50 minus 76 is equal to negative 26. Yes, negative 26 is equal to negative 26. Therefore, the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. Perfect. We've shown algebraically for the first equation that this works. Now, draw your vertical line to represent that we're going to go on to our next equation. That was only, or we're going to go on to our next point for this one because we want to make sure that it, I, actually we are going to the next equation because we want to make sure it's verified for both. So our, in our next equation, we're going to take that same point, in this case our negative 5 and 4, and we're going to plug it in as, first of all, negative 5 squared. And then it was plus 8 times the x value or 8 times negative 5. Then we added or we subtracted the y, which was 4 for this case. And then this is equal to negative 19. All right, this is 25 minus 40 minus 4 is equal to negative 19. What we're going to find is that this is negative 19, which is equal to negative 19. And the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Now we can continue to our next point here. So we're going to draw a vertical line. We've confirmed it works for the first equation, but we, now we need to make sure our first point, I should say. So that first intersection works. Now what we want to do is take the second point and plug it into the two equations. So our first equation, again, was the 2x squared. So we're going to write this as 2 times the second x value was negative 3 squared. Then we add 16 times that value, 16 times negative 3. And then we take the y and we add it, which was 4. And supposedly this is equal to negative 26. Well, 2 times 9 is going to be 18 plus our 16 times 3. Well, just because I want to make sure we're good with this, 16 times our 3. There we go. So we'll get negative 48. So I'll put that here. 
and then plus 4 is equal to negative 26. This is the same as 22 minus 48. Yes, this is going to be equal to negative 26. There we go. So therefore, our left-hand side equals our right-hand side. And I'll just clean that up just a tad. There we go. Left-hand side equals right-hand side. Awesome. Now, we just have to make sure it works for our next equation, and then we're good. Now, because we're kind of lacking space here, just based on how much it required for this, what I'm going to do is maybe just do the, uh, I'll do the verification right below. Um, so maybe we'll like box this just like we've done before, and then I'll just create like a little section right below here. Um, okay, so for our second equation, it was x squared, in this case, which our x is negative 3 squared. Um, and then plus 8 times that negative 3. And then we had minus y, which is 4, is equal to negative 19. Well, this is the same as 9 minus 24 minus 4 is equal to negative 19. Well, negative 24 and negative 4 combined to make negative 28. Negative 28 plus 9 is definitely negative 19. So this is going to be equal to negative 19. And therefore, our left-hand side is equal to our right-hand side. And hey, we've verified that this works for all possible equations. Great. So that's when they say verify algebraically, you're going to have to show exactly this work, that the solutions work for those original equations and that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Okay. Now, in example two, which of the point is a solution to the system? Now, when we see this, first and foremost, what you want to be thinking is that we need to make sure that this is in form of if they give us these solutions like this, or they give us options for the solutions, because we don't know which one it is, what you can do to verify this or to figure out which point is actually a system or a solution to the system is you can isolate these both for y. Or what you could do is take each of these points and plug them into your uh, into the functions. So when I plug them both into the functions, you're actually going to find that the answer is D for this one. Now, if you don't believe me, what we're going to do is we're just going to verify that. And maybe we can use that. Hmm, what type of space do we have here? So maybe we'll do this right below on the question. So I'm going to take that first equation, which is 2y. And if I take 2y, it's actually 2 times 3 is equal to the x value, which is 2 squared plus 4 times 2. Um, and then minus 6. Well, this is the same as saying 6 is equal to 4 plus 8 minus 6. 4 plus 8 is 12. Minus 6 is 6. So 6 equals 6. Left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. Perfect. It works. All right. Now, if this works, what we're going to do is now we're going to confirm this for the second equation. So we take 2 and 3. And what we're going to do is we're going to plug this in as 3 for the y value minus the x value, which is 2, minus 1 is equal to 0. 3 minus 2 is going to be equal to 1. 1 minus 1 gives us 0. So 0 is equal to 0. And therefore, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. And for this type of a question, there will only be one that satisfies this specifically in which they asked it. So this would be that point in which these two functions intersect. And if you don't know from just the form, we have a quadratic because of a degree 2. We have a linear because of the degree 1 on the x here. So it's, it's strictly going to cross over one time. What language did we use in the previous questions? We said that this is a point of tangency or that there is one specific point. There is a tangent line at this point that makes the 2 and 3. All right. How many solutions does this system have? All right. Now, in this situation, what we want to be thinking about is to figure out how many solutions this has. I would recommend putting this into y equals, especially if they ask you how many solutions it has. You can actually tell based on the fact that when you rewrite them as y is equal to, it gives away a lot about its form and what the possible solutions are. So in the first situation, we see that it is 2y minus 10 is equal to 4x squared minus 8x plus 4. I'm just going to rewrite this such that it is y isolated. Now, to do that, what we're going to do is, first of all, take this negative 10 and add it across. So when I do that, I'm going to get the following. And maybe it might make sense to actually do this question right below and then just circle the solution here. So I'm going to start with that first equation. We're going to write it as 2y is equal to, and I'm going to take the 4x squared and write it again, our negative 8x. And then if I take 10 and I add it across to both sides, this actually gives me positive 14. Now, to make this into a y equals, 
I'm going to divide both sides by 2. When I divide both sides by 2, I'm going to end up getting y is equal to 2x squared minus 4x and then plus 7. Okay, so this is my one function that I have. Now, to see what happens, I recommend you expand out the second one here. So for the second one, we're going to write this as y is equal to 2 times, instead of x minus 1 squared, I'm going to write it as x minus 1 times x minus 1, all plus 5. Because we know that a binomial squared is not just x squared minus 1 squared, we have to expand it out twice. When you expand this, you're going to end up getting, and let's see if I can leave some space here. So this is going to be 2x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus 5. And that was me collecting the middle terms, so I kind of skipped a step in there. Hopefully that's okay based on our past two units. Now I'm going to expand the 2 in. This is going to be y is equal to 2x squared minus 4x plus 2 plus 5 on the very outside. And here's what we need to see. This is going to be actually equal to 2x squared minus 4x plus 7. Look at what just happened. I'm going to actually highlight them so that you can see what happened. Y is equal to this. Y is equal to this. They are the exact same graph, meaning how many solutions occur when you have the exact same graph overlying each other? It is infinitely many. Now, you're going to see examples of the different situations where maybe you'll have two solutions, one solution, no solution. We're going to talk about that a little bit more on our next page. So don't worry, we'll, we'll see some situations like that, or we'll see some situations of that throughout the unit. So don't be uh, too concerned there. Okay, now flipping the page here, we have example four where they say write the system of equations that's indicated by the graphs below. There's a couple of things we need to figure out here. First and foremost is in order to figure out the equation of a linear line, which is represented by the straight line with the negative slope here, what we need to first of all do is write it as the following. We know that the in the case of this specific one, a linear line has the following form. We're going to write our form as y is equal to mx plus b, where we need to break down a couple things. First and foremost, the m is the slope. The b is the y-intercept. Okay, so let's establish what the y-intercept of this graph is. The y-intercept seems to be at 2. So we're going to write this as 0 and 2. And I'll make sure I zoom in just a little bit so I have this. So this is 0 and 2. There we go. What is the slope? Well, we can go between any two points. It's the rise over run from left to right. To go from this point, I have to go down 2, or down in this case 3, because I'm going from 2 to negative 1, and then I'm going to go over by 1. If I go down 3 and over 1, that means that my slope is negative 3 over 1, or essentially negative 3. Okay, let's put that together here. So first equation, equation number 1, and I'm going to actually surround them in brackets here. Equation number one is negative three x, and then the y-intercept was positive two. All right, we need another equation that we can pair with this to figure out the one that represents the quadratic. If you remember from the unit, there was a couple things we wanted to point out. First and foremost, we have a maximum point, and the graph faces down at this p and q. The p and q is positive two for p, q is equal to one, so that's our vertex point, and I'll even include that here, that this is a P and a Q as an ordered pair. We know that we have some other point. In this case, there is a point at 0 and negative 1. So I'm going to put that here, 0 and negative 1, which is representative of an X and a Y. Now, the reason I'm annotating that is because it's going to help us out here. If we know that this is an X and Y and this is a P and a Q, to solve for the secondary equation here, what we're going to do is we're going to do the following. I'm going to write this as the, this is going to be y is equal to a x minus p all squared plus q. Remember, this is our original vertex equation. Now, we always need to solve for a. We never know what that stretch factor is, that vertical stretch factor that causes these graphs to change, which essentially is saying how wide or narrow the graph is. So we need to solve for that first and foremost. We're going to plug in all the values we know. Our x and y is 0 and negative 1. So it's going to be negative 1 is equal to a zero for x. The p value was positive two, therefore it must be negative in the brackets. Our q value was equal to, I believe, positive one, and we don't do any fancy tricks with that one. This is going to be negative one is equal to a times four, because negative two squared is four, 
plus 1. If I subtract 1 from both sides, which I'll do here, subtracting 1 from both sides is going to give me negative 2 is equal to a times 4. If I divide both sides by 2, therefore I'm going to get an a value, which is equal to negative 1 half. Or in this case, and I'm dividing by 2 there, I shouldn't be dividing by 2, I should be dividing by 4. I was like, hmm, that seems a lot. So I divide by 4, divide by 4, negative 2 over 4, this is the same as negative 1 half. So my equation in vertex form is going to be y is equal to negative 1 half in the brackets x minus 2 all squared, and then plus the 1, which represents the q value of my vertex. Awesome. Okay, now write the system of equations that is indicated, which we've just done, then solve the system to the nearest tenth. Well, to solve this system to the nearest tenth, we would type this into our graphing calculator and figure it out. Now, what we're going to find is that there is actually the one solution here. The one solution, and there's actually two solutions, but for this situation, it almost looks like there's just one. In this graph, one of our solutions is listed at the green part here. It's right where they intersect. That would be considered the solution that we're interested in. So if that's the solution, there's also another solution that's like way off of the graph down here, but we would need our graphing calculator to solve it, which I'll just give you the value. Therefore, if we put this into our calculator as y1 and y2, we're going to figure out that one of the solutions to the nearest tenth is at 0 0.6 and 0 0.1. So that represents that first solution that's indicated by the green dot. We then have another solution, which is at 9.4 for x and at negative 26.1. Now, this one's a little bit annoying in the sense of when we get a solution like this, that, or when we get a graph that looks like this that's given to us in this manner, we almost think that there's just one solution, but we got to be very careful that eventually if this continues down this way and the linear line continues down this way, that second intersection point occurs off the graph down below. So I'm just going to give you that value just so that you know that that exists and that it is a part of the overall solutions here. Okay, excellent. Now, moving on to example five here. Use your graphing calculator to help us sketch the following. So we can type both of these functions into our graphing calculator for y1 and y2. Now, to provide a little bit of color on this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent the first equation using blue, I'm going to represent the second equation using red. Now, when you graph these things, and I've actually taken the liberty to type these into my graphing calculator ahead of time here, what we're going to find is that when we type these in, we get the following graphs. And this is under the standard window settings. So I haven't adapted these at all. My x minimums, my y minimums are negative 10. My maximums are 10 both each. So let's take a second and sketch this out here over here. First and foremost, if I know that there is a positive a value from our quadratic functions unit, that means that the red graph is symbolic of this graph. Now we also can see that this one has a decimal or that it's a, a value, an a value between 0 and 1. And an a value between 0 and 1 is a wider graph like the blue graph. The ones that are greater than 1 have a narrow graph like the red graph. Okay. Let's just make sure I select my pen tool that's appropriate for this. So I'm going to do the red graph first, which is our upwards facing graph like this. So it's going to cross something like this and then come back up and we're going to draw arrows on the ends here. In the blue graph, well, this is our wider graph. It's going to start somewhere up here. It kind of like cuts through about here and then comes down that way. And then on the opposite side, very, very similar. It's a little bit wider like this. So just to really emphasize the width of the blue versus the red, I'm just kind of showing it how wide it goes on these. All right, now we get two different intersection points. In our graphing calculator, we would go second trace intersect or shift G solve and intersect. When you do that, you actually figure out that these points of intersection at these two points are going to be the following. First and foremost, and let's actually just do this in our calculator so that we can get the values together. I'm going to go second trace intersect, which is five on the Casio, it's a little different. You're going to have to go over to one of them. And then for my calculator, I go left and right bound for you. You're just going to click enter three times. Now our first intersection, they say in the calculator occurs at negative two for X and then positive two for Y. That's the intersection that is right here. Our second intersection, this one is going to be second trace. We go down to intersect. We go left and right bound. For you, you just need to click enter three times. Just go over the point and click enter three times. 
we find that the intersection is going to be at 2 for x and 2 for y, meaning there is nice, perfect symmetry around these things. And I just want to make sure that those arrows are a little neater. There we go. Perfect. So there's our second point. So find the coordinates of these. Let's make sure we write them out. First and foremost, we had one at negative 2 and 2. The second one was at 2 and positive 2. How could you transform one of the graphs so that the graphs do not intersect? So instead of this being the case where we have the blue and the red graphs and they overlay each other at least twice, what we could do is we could alter the equations. I'm going to alter the red equation such that it would be something that wouldn't uh, cross or wouldn't even cross through the blue one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and be like, we have to think about what transformations would be involved in that. If my blue graph is downwards facing and I wanted to adjust the red graph so that it didn't cross, well, what I would have to do is I would have to increase this overall uh, y value, or I would have to increase the intercept, the x or the p value. So if I know that this graph has the following form and looks like this, in order for them not to intersect, I would want to lift the red graph high enough that such that they never cross. And then there's that white space between them. So we need to choose a Q value, which is here, such that it is greater than the Q value here. Let's use something like 0.7. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for this red graph, instead of it being the Y is equal to 2X minus 6, I could write this as, and let's actually write this in the following way. Let's say the original was equal to Y equals 2X squared minus 6. I'm going to transform that to then be Y is equal to 2X squared. But instead of minus six, I'm going to make it like plus five. It could be plus six, seven, whatever. We just need some uh, Q value that's large enough such that the red graph would move up and not cross at all. All right. Now, what if we wanted to have none that cross through the blue or through the red graph? What we'd want to do is do the exact same thing here. So if I'm thinking about uh, just to make sure, we're looking at originally the blue graph. Now I want something that doesn't cross through the red graph. Um, and I just want to make sure I'm doing this correctly in that way. How could you transform one of the graphs so that they do not intersect? Write the equation of the image of the transformation. Yeah. So in, this, in the case of the first one, that works for the blue graph, making sure that they don't cross one facing down, one facing up. If we wanted something that didn't cross the red, what we could do is we could do the same thing with the blue graph. And so I'm going to write this as an or uh, situation. So or, so the first situation was, let's see if we adjust the uh, red graph and move it up. There we go. Didn't want to erase on me. So now we're going to go or. What if I take that original blue graph, which is 0.5x squared, and then I just want to make sure I get the y value correct. There we go, or the y-intercept. It was plus 4. If I want to transform this such that it doesn't cross the red graph, I would have to make it below the red graph, meaning this blue graph, I'm going to have to shift it down such that it's completely below the red and that there's that space between them. In order to do that, I see that this one crosses at negative 6, I just need to make this something less than negative 6. So let's say I choose something like y is equal to negative 0.5x squared. And then instead of negative 6, I'm going to make it like negative 8 there. Perfect. So both of these would work in these situations here. And I'm just going to match these styles here so that they look similar. So squiggle, arrow, done. Okay. Now, how could you transform one of the graphs so that they intersect exactly at one point? The trick around these is you just want the Q values to be the same. If the Q values are the same, what that does is that it means that they have the same Y intercept. And if I move the red graph up to this, or I move the blue graph down like this, and they intersect at that exact same Q value, when they open upwards and they open downwards, and they're that opposite like that, we know that they're going to intersect only one time exactly at their mins and max, exactly at the min and max. So let's do that for both of these equations. If I want to make this so that it is y is equal to 2x squared and then minus 6, if I want to make sure that that graph is the exact same but in the opposite direction as my blue graph, I'm going to make it plus 4 for this. So I'm going to go down and go, okay, we know that the other one was y equals negative 1 half x squared minus or plus 4. I'm going to make this 2x squared plus 4. I'm going to match the q value. Okay. The other way in which we can make these intersect exactly one time, we take the other function, y equals 
negative 0.5x squared, and this was plus 4. If the red graph had a y-intercept of negative 6, we're just going to match that y-intercept. So this is going to be y is equal to negative 0.5x squared, and instead of it being the plus 4, we're going to make it minus 6. And again, what does this do? When the q values are equal to each other, but they have opposite opening graphs, one opens upwards, one opens downwards, this causes it to then intersect only at the mins and maxes. Okay, moving forward, if we want to relate this to a system in terms of some sort of a uh, sentence, so they're going to give us some sort of context and they want us to figure this out, what we're going to have to do is let's take a look at a situation where they get us to consider some sort of real life scenario and then graph it based on that situation. Two divers start their dives at the same time. One diver jumps from a one meter springboard and the other jumps from a three meter springboard, so slightly different heights. Their heights above the water were plotted over time. Which of the system could model it, or which system could model this situation and explain your choice, then tell why the other graphs could not model this situation? Well, first and foremost, I look to something like system B, and I'm like, well, the issue is, is that if I see that the blue graph is starting at zero, that's a height of zero, and we said that they were both starting at one and three. So if they're starting at one and three, this one doesn't work. This one has something where it's like it starts at zero. And so I'm even going to annotate that here. The blue graph, this one starts at zero. Which cannot be. All right, system C, they're both starting at zero. But that's not what they said. They said at time zero, one of them starts at one and three. They both start at zero. which definitely doesn't work. And then our other situation, we see that they're not even starting at time zero and they're both actually starting at a zero height. That doesn't work. So we're going to say not only do they both start at zero height, they both don't start at time zero. There we go. So really important there. And let's just make sure that this has our comma there. Perfect. Okay. So the only option that works for here is if we know that C doesn't represent it, D does not represent it because th those are both off on that situation. It must be the first one. And let's just confirm that when we look at this one, yes, this one's going to work and I'm just going to change the color. It's going to work because this one looks like at time zero, it starts at roughly about one meter. This one starts at about triple the height, which we could say is the three meters that we're looking for. And because they're both starting at time zero and they're separated with a starting distance of one and three, this looks like the best situation. Now, why is it that if I look at the blue graph and the green graph that they'll never intersect? Well, simply put, if you have two different divers and they're diving from different heights, once they make their dive from the platform, they both face gravity and According to Physics 20 or even any sort of physics class, gravity is the reason. And gravity is the same for both divers. AKA, they accelerate at the same rate. yet are separated. By two meters. There we go. Perfect. All right. Now, um, just to make sure that this looks a little bit better, because obviously I want to make sure that those are good for our notes. There we go. By two meters. Perfect. There we go. All right. Example six, applying the system of equations or applying system of equations into specific situations. So very similar to that last one, we're just going to have a slightly different context. Suppose that one stunt diver 
or that this one stunt has two different performers that are both applying into this given stunt. Now, they are slightly offset from each other. So there's two springboards and these springboards, we have one diver that dives off the left-hand one, we have one diver that dives off the right-hand one, and supposedly, when we see that they when they do this dive and they're doing this trick, they're both in the air for 1.5 seconds. How can we tell that? Well, they say that that's in the context, but we can also see graphically from 0 to 1.5, the one diver's in the air, the other diver starts at 2.5 or on the right-hand side and goes to 1, meaning that difference is also 1.5. So both divers, they are in the air for 1.5 seconds, meaning they probably dived in a very synchronized way that such that their heights were identical, which in this case they were. Now, determine the system of equations that models the performer's height during the stunt. One thing we should know is that if these represent the exact same parabola and they're in the air for the exact same amount of time, by projectile motion principles, we would say that these two graphs actually are the exact same parabola just shifted apart from one another, which should make sense. If this is a stunt where they're trying to synchronize and then high five in the air or, you know, give each other some sort of contact within some sort of window of this, what we're going to look at and say is that one diver goes this way, one diver goes this way, they overlap each other at one exact moment when they give each other the high five, and then they come back down to the ground after that. Okay, first and foremost, we need to solve for the A value. Now, to figure out the A value here, what we're going to do is we want to figure out if the A value is the piece that we're missing, we're going to figure this out using some sort of system, or not system of equations, but we're going to figure this out using our principles from unit one, which was we needed a point. In this case, I'm going to choose zero, zero down here. So let's say zero, zero is the one point. And then we know the parabola, there's in the air for 1.5 seconds, meaning the middle here, and we should actually just label that on our graph. If this is the middle, and this is the maximum height, the vertex for this equation, or the vertex for the both of these parabolas technically would be the following. And I'm just going to arrow down to here. We're going to have this at 0 0.75, because that's half of 1.5. So 0 0.75 seconds is when they reach the maximum height. The maximum height is at 4.5 above the springboard or above the ground. And so, and, and realistically, I mean, we could do that same thing over here. But instead of it being at 0 0.75, we're going to say that from 1 to 2.5, if we split that in half, we would be at 1.75. And let's just make sure here. So if I take, whoops, I'm going to bring my calculator here. I'm going to take the uh, 2.5, and let's actually make sure I add them together on the main screen. Take 2.5, I add my 1, which is my two uh, intercepts in this case. I divide them by 2 to average them it's going to give me 1.75, which should make se uh, sense here. So we're just shifted over by one second, which we're not actually going one second more. It's just in terms of the way that we're going to graph this, that's our vertex for this one. Okay, so the vertex of the second performer is here. And then because we know the A value is going to be the same for both of these, we don't need another point for this one. We're actually just going to solve for the A value using the first performer. Okay, let's build out our equations. So first and foremost, I always start by writing out the equation. Y is equal to A, X minus P, all squared plus Q. Now, our Y value is zero. Our A value is what we're searching for. X is zero. P is equal to negative 0 0.75. Remember, if it was positive, because we moved right, it's actually negative. The Q value is equal to positive 4.5. Now we want to solve for our A value. We're going to say this is 0 is equal to A, 0 0.75 squared. Let's just make sure we get the right answer in our calculator, 0 0.5625. And because I like to verify these things and double check, 5625, good. And this is going to be plus 4.5. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 4.5 from both sides. So minus 4.5, minus 4.5. When I minus 4.5 from both sides, I get negative 4.5 is equal to A multiplied by 0 0.5625. Now I want to divide both sides by this overall situation. So 0 0.5625. Excellent. And then here's what we get. 
we get an A value, which is equal to, and let me make sure I just erase this here, A is equal to, let's type it into our calculator, 4.5, and I'm going to ignore the negative just for now because I can add it, 4.5 divided by 0 0.5625, this is going to be equal to 8. And more specifically, negative 8, because there was a negative attached to the 4.5. Now, here's what we can do for our system of equations. System of equations, we often write this bigger bracket. We're going to write our first equation. y is equal to negative 8 x minus, for this one, it's going to be x minus 0 0.75. This is the first performer squared plus 4.5. For our second performer, it's going to be y is equal to negative 8 because they share an a value, x minus 1.75 because instead of at 0 0.75, they have their uh, parabolic maximum height at 1.75 seconds, which technically this is just a shift in a graph, so don't think about that quite literally. It would still be, in reality, 0 0.75 seconds plus 4.5, which is the maximum height. Awesome. So this is the system of equations that works for this situation. And I'm just going to lower this down just a little bit because technically this is our solution. And we could even say, therefore, there we go, making that a touch neater, and I'll highlight it. So therefore, there we go, and let's make sure it all gets highlighted. Perfect. Okay. Solve the system graphically using technology. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to type these in as y1 and y2. So I'm just going to write the exact same things we had above. y is equal to, and we, we already have that set, so I'm not going to put that in, negative 8. We're going to put x minus 0 0.75 all squared plus 4.5. For our second function, it's negative 8, x minus 1.75 all squared plus 4.5. And then in our window settings here, well, let's just take a second and look at actually what this looks like because it might affect our window settings. So I'm going to plug this into the graphing calculator using these two. So I'm going to clear out those original functions that we had in here. This is negative 8 bracket uh, x minus the 0 0.75 close bracket square it plus 4.5. In our second one, it's negative 8 bracket x minus 1.75 bracket. Uh, squared and then plus 4.5 graph there they are now to adjust our window settings because we see all that void space on the left and upwards and maybe even a little on the right i'm going to start by decreasing the x minimum to something like negative one and then i'm going to make my x maximum something like maybe instead of that i'll make it eight my y uh, minimum, I'm going to make that like negative 2 because we don't need to see all that void space in the, the bottom there. Our x max, let's keep it as 10. So here's my possible window settings. Let's just make sure we graph it and then we'll confirm if this works. Ah, I still see a bunch of void space on the right. So I'm going to get rid of that by decreasing my x maximum to something like 4. And when we make it 4, let's graph it. Yeah, that looks a lot better. So let's go back to our window settings. Let's copy them out. Our scale, we try not to adjust that, it's one and one. Our minimum is negative one, our maximum is four. Our minimum is gonna be negative two for y, our maximum is 10, there we go. Now we're gonna graph it so that we have the actual plot here. Let's make sure we do a rough sketch of this here. Our axes are gonna look like the following. We have one on the left, we have one on the bottom here because we're focusing on quadrant one. And I'll actually even lower that down just a tad. And there we go. Now, let's draw our first graph in blue. Our first graph, which was representative of y1, is this one. Our second graph is y2, which is this one here. And I might need to actually fill these in here. So there we go. There's our first. There's our second. Okay, now let's provide a rough sketch of what these two look like. Starting off with our blue graph, we're going to draw it cutting through the origin. And I'm just going to freehand these. So cutting through the origin, going up to about 4.5, and I want to make sure this is actually neat. There we go. And then comes back down as such. And it's a lot less, so I'm going to make sure it's actually a little bit better. So there's our first graph, arrows on the end, representing that it extends to infinity. Now what I'm going to do is just hide this for a second, bring it back. We want to draw in our red graph. Our red graph was about at 1, cuts through matches its maximum height, comes back down like this. Now, I know that they don't show as, or we show a little bit more on the right-hand side. 
this will be fine for now. If you just draw in your graph very roughly like this, we're okay. Now, our intersection point is going to be right here, and this is where they high five each other. So when they do the stunt and one jumps from the left, the other jumps from the right, they're going to meet at the specific point. We want to solve this graphically. What we're going to do is go second trace or in your uh, Casio shift G solve, go down to your intersect key or click intersect. Now for mine, again, I do left bound, right bound. You just need to go to the intersection and click enter one, two, and three times. Okay. Now this means that my point is going to be at negative one point or sorry, 1.25 and 2.5. So 1.25 and 2.5. There we go. And for some reason, it doesn't want to agree with me. There you go. Okay, so this is the solution to this equation here, or this system of equations. Now, interpret your solution with respect to this situation. What this means is that at 1.25 seconds, they will be at 2.5 meters in the air, and that's where they'll high five. And I just want to make sure my units are okay with this. Yes, we're talking about meters and seconds, so let's just make sure we have this. So at 1.25 seconds, the two performers will high five. at 2.5 meters in the air. There we go. Perfect. All right. There it is. Now, here's where you're going to want to move on to your assignment. For these two, remember, there's a couple major, major things we want to look at. First and foremost, when you're trying to put these into your graphing calculator, both of the functions have to be y equals. We can clearly see there's a lot of uh, layover or there's a lot of crossover, I should say, between our previous units. So quadratic functions, quadratic equations, we're seeing a lot of the concepts blend together here. So it's really important that we're continuously reviewing these topics and that we're continuously thinking that, hey, we're going to be pulling knowledge from our previous units. All right, get some work with the assignment. Good luck. See me if you need help.